All right, welcome back to another edition of Breaking Points, Intercept Edition. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by my colleague, uh, Lee Fong, to talk about his latest story. We could uh, put that one up if you have it here. Uh, he, he takes a, a deep dive into the evolution of the u- union busting, or what they call kind of union avoidance, and there are other u- euphemisms for it as well. Corporations hire consulting firms to come in and talk with managers and talk with staff in order to encourage those staff not to form a union. That's as, that's as old as the Pinkertons and, and even before. Lee is writing on a, a new phenomenon within this industry in which these uh, union avoidance firms are adopting the language of social justice in order to appeal directly to workers whose primary concern is, is that, with the goal of stopping them from forming a union. So Lee, Lee when did you first notice this happening and how, how did you kind of, how, how, did you, how did you spot this trend starting to develop? Hey Ryan, thanks for having me. I'm based in San Francisco and you know I've covered the labor movement uh, the push for better wages and benefits for a very long time. Also, I, I'm based in San Francisco, and really over the last four or five years, there's been kind of an unprecedented worker rebellion in Silicon Valley. There's been walkouts at Google, you know, protests at a, at a lot of the big tech companies. Uh, workers, for really the very first time in this sector, have pushed towards uh a labor union or, or joining the labor movement in, in some way. And in many cases, uh, these workers have been sidelined. They've been pushed back. And corporations here in the, in the tech industry are adopting the language of social justice, uh, these demands for racial representation, as a way to kind of co-opt the energy uh, from these, these labor movements and uh, to tell workers you know, you don't need to join the labor union. And I, I've kind of watched from the outside uh, this dynamic, and I, I got interested in it. And I, I've, I've been researching and attending webinars and a, a recent conference from the union avoidance industry um, and really seen that this dynamic of uh, employers, human re- resource departments, union avoidance consultants uh, a- adopting the kind of language and tactics of the social justice movement this has gone coast to coast. It's not really just in Silicon Valley anymore. Um, we're, we're seeing companies all over the country uh, attempting to, you know, adopt uh, DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion um, officers or consultants, uh, kind of draping the, the company in the language and symbols of just social justice to basically tell workers who are uh, demanding more rights at work or interested in joining a union. Hey, uh, you don't need to join this third party, this labor union, if you're interested in, in getting politically active or getting more rights at work. The company is already a social justice organization. And um, th- this has been a, a really new tactic, but it's, it's become commonplace within the union avoidance industry. And w- one of the things that I like about your reporting, not just in this piece, but, but in general, is that you often go to these industry conferences. Um, it, it can. I've I've only done that a handful of times, and every time I I have, I've been amazed at the honesty on display. And, you know what you're, what you're able to get, and you don't have to sneak in. I my I I, I'm, I don't think you snuck into these particular ones when I've gone. You just kind of register as press, and they say, "Hey, welcome, you we know, welcome to our conference." And then and then they tell everything that they're thinking. And so what you know what and since you've been going to these types of things for a while, what 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 have you noticed change, and what did you you know, what what was the kind what was the kind of kind of mood at these conferences or webinars behind this this advice that they were giving to companies that you need to lean in on this this particular set of language and politics in order to uh, you know suck out the energy of the union drive well look you know since the 1970s um, the union avoidance industry has really transformed in, in many ways you know going back to the early 19th century um, Union avoidance was very violent. You know, famously, there were the Pinkertons, one of the first kind of private security companies that were hired to uh, block workers um, on the picket line to sometimes have violent clashes with with the union activists. But, you know, if you zoom up to the 1970s, um, the employers, the, you know, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, big business at large, um, got more sophisticated. They decided, hey, we need to hire industrial psychologists. We need to kind of 
gather lots of intelligence from workers and really understand them um, and understand their values and, and figure out ways to make them hate labor unions, make them more loyal to managers. Uh, one of the groups that kind of got born out of this uh, new crusade against uh, unions uh, was the Council for a Union-Free Environment, CUE. Um, uh, this is a group that every year kind of brings together the biggest employers in America, the consultants and lawyers and human resource departments that help in union avoidance. And they discuss the latest tactics on how to uh, block uh, labor unions to stop strikes, uh, to defeat uh, union elections. And I, I attended their latest conference in, in spring. And, you know, there are many large employers. There are consultants hired by Amazon for their warehouse drives from uh, the, the top executive at Kellogg's who dealt with uh, labor relations issues, who had attempted to lock serial workers who were striking last year out and, and replace them uh, with, you know, what the union activists call scabs. Um, and, you know, you watch, I, I watched this, this, this conference for two days and yeah, I, I registered it under my name and, you know, there's no subterfuge there. Um, and really the whole conference was littered with uh, the language of, uh, you know, hey, we've got to talk about workplace belonging. We're not union busters. We're diversity consultants. Um, we need to talk about uh, the, the importance of diversity, of, of matching um, diverse managers uh, with diverse employee groups. Uh, we need to look at how a lot of these millennial and Gen Z workers are not just focused on the bread and butter of wages and benefits. A lot of them are interested in respect in the workplace and saying, hey, why isn't my corporation taking uh, a stance on these social justice movements around identity, whether that's Black Lives Matter or Me Too or, or some or some of these other movements? Um, uh, the, for these union avoidance consultants, they were thinking, hey, how do we get ahead of this? How do we pivot very quickly and co-op some of this language and, and position our corporations uh, in a way that uh, deflates interest in labor unions and makes sure sh and, and ensures that our workers remain loyal to us and never join a labor union. Yeah, w which helps to explain why you why you see so many you know statements coming uh, expressing the values of social justice from a lot of these corporations because I think people initially would thought well this is probably consumer facing stuff you know this company wants to be on you know the popular side of this particular issue but it turns out that it it might more likely be an, an internal facing thing. They're putting out a statement because they want to convince their staff that, hey, we are a place that lives your values. And so since we are one, then you don't need to form a union against us. Like we are, we're you. You know, we, we believe in all of the same things that you do. And one of the, thinking about the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce campaign that, that you talked about, one of their most impressive kind of propaganda victories in the 1970s when they pulled in those industrial uh, in psychology consultants and, and developed a more sophisticated strategy was to convince their workers and convince the country at large that unions were just hotbeds of corruption. You know, that if you join a union, then your dues are going to go off to some mafiosa who is you know, who's going to live high on the hog off of your wages. Like, and they very successfully embedded that idea in, in popular culture and also in the minds of workers so that when there would be a union driver, uh, they, that they could say, look, why do you want to do that? You're just going to hand your money over to, to corrupt people. Now, co union corruption doesn't seem to be the, the propaganda angle anymore. You write about how the, the argument now that management is making is actually unions are hotbeds of sexism and of and of racism, can you can you talk a bit a little bit about that shift in the way that unions are being portrayed by management? Yeah, and you know, just in terms of that history, I would highly recommend uh, from Blackjacks to Briefcases, uh, a book on the history of union avoidance, or a lot of writing from John Logan. He really looks at how um, corporate consultants and major employers in the '70s they hired uh, special operatives who created you know, daily newspapers only about union corruption and allegations against unions, and it would mail them every day uh, to their employees who were considering a union to, to just kind of convince them to hate labor unions, to see them as actually a malicious force. Um, and, and you really encourage not just a uh, vote against a labor union in a union campaign, but a decertification. We saw thousands of decertifications of companies that were unionized that then voted to get rid of their unions. 
um, out of, born out of this Chamber of Commerce and National Association of Manufacturers uh, led effort. But zoom up to today, you know, uh, now uh, that that argument against labor unions is based on identity based concerns. You know, it's very in vogue um, over the last few years to uh, talk about um, systemic racism or systemic sexism. And, um, we, 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 you know, one example uh, is this uh, North Carolina-based company, uh, No Evil Foods, a uh, vegan uh, uh, food manufacturing company that makes imitation meat products sold in Whole Foods and other high-end uh, groceries. Uh, when they faced uh, a labor union uh, effort, um, they had their uh, captive uh, meetings when they're lecturing uh, their workers on why not to join a union, they said, hey, look, labor unions are known for their sexism. Um, these these folks uh, are, you know, are hotbeds are, of, of sexual harassment. If you really have progressive values, you would remain loyal to, the, to their corporation, uh, not join one of these labor unions. Um, that's, uh, you know, known for, for bigotry or what have you. And, you know, we've seen similar dynamics around the country. Uh, some, some of these, uh, anti-union consultants like Rick Berman has created mailers and, and, and TV ads, uh, that really heighten the focus on, um, you know, past racism or bigotry or, or issues, uh, within labor unions to kind of do kind of, uh, sort of a jujitsu and say, Hey, if, you, if you're interested in justice, why would you join, um, the labor movement that's, that's really known for, um, uh, you know, a, a variety of forms of, of hatred or, or, or bigotry. Right. And the irony, of course, is that, uh, yes, it's obviously it's true. There is a, a there are examples throughout history of racism and sexism, some of it even endemic to it, you know, in the past. But today, it, you know, if a worker is in a union, you know, they probably have stronger protections against discrimination or to, uh, against harassment. Uh, in in the workplace, but it's 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 important, I think, for workers to understand, you know, what the what what the management propaganda campaign is, and this is this is really helpful and uh, ter- terrific reporting. So, Lee, thanks for joining this uh, intercept edition of uh, of Breaking Points. Ryan, thanks for having me. All right, and so stick around. We'll have more uh, Breaking Points for you uh, right after this, and uh, check out Lee's article at theintercept.com. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream. 